Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, report, to the release of the report uh, of the uh, team that went to uh, to Manipur in August. So basically, the team consisted of uh, uh, consisted of uh, some members of the CPML Liberation, uh, and um, they were also representatives of the All India uh, People's Women uh, uh, Progressive Women's Association. All India Lawyers Association for Justice and uh, Du Saraswati, uh, who is an independent uh, uh, activist, a cultural uh, activist and a Dalit uh, author from the state of Karnataka. Uh, the context, of course, uh, as all of us know, is the is the very disturbing situation that has been uh, you know obtaining in Manipur from the third of uh, third of May. Uh, the, the violence, the loss of lives. The kind of uh, division that one, one one saw over there. Uh, for us, at least, you know, uh, uh, we were hoping to go to Manipur uh, quite a while back. Uh, but uh, of course, you know, travel at that point was uh, seeming a bit difficult. So it is uh, on August uh, that we in August that we went from 10th to 14th of August. Uh, in those days uh, that we were there, we managed to uh, visit some of the affected areas as well as the relief camps in uh, uh, two districts in the in the valley, Imphal and Vishnupur. And we also visited with, uh, the affected areas and the relief camps in two of the hill districts, uh, Kankopi and uh, uh, Chuchanpur. Now this... Uh, this uh, Just a minute, there's a technical problem, just a sec. Uh, so we visited uh, basically the affected areas in, in the valley and in the hills. Uh, we also met with, uh, and of course over there, we met with the, uh, the conflict uh, affected uh, people. Uh, we also met with, uh, uh, met with the representatives of both the cookie community as well as the uh, Mete community. Uh, we met. We also met with the superintendent of police in uh, Tangkopi uh, district. Uh, we tried to meet as many of the organizations, even in the valley, uh, including the Mera Paibis. We had a meeting with Eman on on, uh, on that front. Uh, we also met with some of the uh, intellectuals and experts in various areas, particularly forestry, because we wanted to understand that part as well. And finally, we uh, we um, we had a meeting with the with the governor. Uh, uh, Madam uh, uh, Anusia Ulki, uh, and in that meeting, we kind of uh, you know briefed her about uh, what our preliminary you know understandings were. So uh, having come back, you know, we thought that it's necessary for us to put out this report. Initially, it was going to be a very brief report, but then as we started to write it, we felt uh, you know that uh, uh, it's really necessary for us to engage. Uh, and as objectively as possible with several of the allegations and counter allegations that we heard in Manipur. Uh, so we'll be sharing the, the report once this uh, release is done. Uh, broadly speaking, the report uh, consists of uh, it consists of around seven parts of uh, seven parts. Uh, each of the team members uh, who, have, who have gone to Manipur will be presenting on some uh, various aspects of it. Uh, just to introduce the team, uh, uh, from CPML Liberation, uh, uh, Sucheta De, uh, Vivek uh, Das, and um, Pratima Inkpi, and myself, Tim Di Rosario, we were part of the team. Uh, from All India uh, Progressive Women's Association, uh, uh, Krishna Vini Ji uh, was, was, was in the team. Uh, also from uh, CPML Liberation was Avani. Uh, then Madhulika was from the All India Lawyers Association for Justice. And Du Saraswati is the activist, uh, uh, author, cultural uh, uh, activist from Karnataka. So I'd uh, uh, request uh, Sucheta to really to start this uh, this thing and taking us through the uh, through the first parts of the report. Uh, Sucheta, over to you. Thank you, Clifton, and good evening to everyone who have joined today's online release of the report on ethnic segregation and violence in Manipur. Uh, as introduced by Clifton, uh, an eight-member team, we assembled and we went to Manipur in the month of August. Uh, Manipur is presently and has gone through unspeakable 
uh, levels of violence and human segregation. And it is not the first time that the Manipuri uh, state and Manip uh, people of Manipur uh, are facing violence, are facing state neglect to it. So Manipur being in a state in the northeastern region of India has been cheated for very long by the governments running India from New Delhi as a marginal land, as a land in the border area of India, which only uh, has been looked through the prism of uh, providing some kind of gateway to another land, to the Southeast Asian region, or a gateway to another economic region, or Manipur, like other Northeastern states, have been treated from the angle of national security. So, uh, and that is why, I mean, even today, the level of neglect uh, that we are observing from the government speaks much about the history of how Manipur has been treated, the people of Manipur have been treated. The violence that we all know about in Manipur, according to official estimates, according to estimates given by the representatives of the government, uh, in the month of July, more than 200 people have been killed in Manipur and more than 60,000 people have been displaced. As we can understand that this is a, a statistic that has been given by the government which has massively failed in uh, controlling this uh, massive human disaster that has unfolded in Manipur. We can understand that these statistics are underrated. Many more people must have been displaced and many more people must have been killed given the level of violence that we have seen unfolding in Manipur. The violence, uh, as has been widely reported and something that we also found out, mainly started uh, from the 3rd of May. And there are, right now, if we look at the uh, Manipur society, if we talk to people there, uh, it appears that every community has their own versions. It appears that, uh, you know, there is the, 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 even the narratives are so polarized, are so segregated. Uh, so one thing that came out from the cookie community, from the representatives of uh, cookie, cookie community we talked to, as we know that cookie community is one of the communities that is affected in this uh, saga of violence and displacement. So representatives of the cookie community told us that the cookies who mainly reside in the hills and uh, are, are a part of the hill tribe, uh, tribes, uh, tribal society in Manipur, have been massively discriminated against by the present go state government led by Mr. Biren Singh from the BJP. They have told us that after the BJP came to power, in the second term of their government, there were clear uh, examples of, there are clear indications of how the state government is treating one of the major constituents of Manipuri society, that is the cookies. They have told us that there has been instances of victimization for speaking out, for criticizing the state government. They have told us that students have been picked up. There has been allegations, there has been FIRs, which has been filed against them. They have been jailed. Representatives of the cookie community told us that uh, there were several notices of evacuation of, uh, you know, uh, there are several notices given to villages where people are staying, where people have, people have been staying for many years now. They have been in the hill areas where mainly uh, the cookie communities live. They have been given notices of evacu evacuation from that area. So they have to, the cookie communities feel that there has been an there has been an attempt to displace them from the uh, hills of Manipur that they reside in. The representatives of cookie community also told us, which we could also uh, see in the dominant narrative that the state itself, the state government itself upholds. The cookie community have to have they told us that. Uh, there was a concerted effort for, uh, sponsored by the state government to otherize the cookie community in uh, very blatant ways. So all of us have heard discourses 
from the Chief Minister of Manipur about how the cookie community is mainly uh, that they, they are mainly illegal infiltrators. Uh, we have been told how the cookie community is in a way, uh, you know, taking over the forest lands of uh, the hills because there are lots of infiltrators. So a particular type of otherization by calling a community, which constitutes a major part of Manipuri society, infiltrator, illegal infiltrator. Then the CM himself has told so many times about his wire on drugs. So we have been told that the cookie community is majorly involved these days in poppy cultivation and the hill lands of Manipur have been taken over by poppy cultivation. Whereas, uh, you know, there are narratives which we'll discuss very shortly. Uh, there are, there are uh, uh, the people who have been there in the Manipur police at very senior positions, the chief minister himself. Uh, disruption, uh, interruption. Uh, so, uh, how the chief minister himself has been involved in the so called drug cartels, where it is the Kuki community, which has been projected in a particular light as if, uh, you know, they are all of them are involved in poppy cultivation and hills of Manipur uh, of the state Manipur have been taken over by poppy cultivation. So, these are the narratives, and this is the treatment that the Kuki community has faced from the present NBN Singh led BJP government of Manipur. On the other hand, the Maitais, uh, the narrative of the Maitais are that with something with that has also been uh, that that is also being uh, upheld by the state, the, by the state government of Manipur, which is uh, all these things that the cookie com they, there has been a major infiltration from Myanmar uh, of cookie community. They are taking over the hills. They are mainly involved in uh, poppy cultivation. They want to disintegrate Manipur. Uh, they are the ones who started the violence. So these are the two narratives that we encountered. And uh, uh, about the genesis of the violence also, there are two narratives. On 3rd of uh, May, there was a uh, rally called by all tribals of Manipur in the hill districts, in the hill areas of Manipur, condemning, criticizing the uh, attempt to grant ST status to the Maitais. But the cookies have categorically told us that uh, the, the rally was called on 3rd May. It was there in all the hill districts and there was an attempt by uh, majoritarian chauvinist groups to in a way trigger violence. So the representatives of the cookie community told us there was an attempt to uh, torch the Anglo cookie uh, wire memorial gate at the entrance of Churachadpur. That is what the representatives of the cookie community have told us. And on the other hand, uh, of course, the state government as well as representatives of the Maitai community, they believe that uh, this was a targeted violence, this was a planned violence from the side of the cookies, and uh, cookie armed groups uh, are involved. So the even on the genesis of the violence, there are narratives. But the fact of the matter today uh, is that more than 200 people have died in this violence, more than 60,000 people are displaced. Yes, they belong from both the communities, but the cookies uh, being, you know, uh, because the cookies stay in the hills and uh, structurally, economically, politically, uh, they are at a disadvantageous uh, stage, disadvantageous level as compared to the Maitais. And the number of uh, cookies who have been killed are definitely uh, more than the number of people, although uh, any human life that uh, that is taken, that is killed, has equal value. We hold that position. But there is a, while we talk of the uh, violence, you know, one thing that I must mention while uh, we are discussing about the narratives around genesis of the violence is uh, the issue of the granting scheduled tribe status to the Maitais. So, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, in the month of March, the High Court of Manipur had uh, asked, in a way, the government of uh, government of Manipur to consider granting of ST status to the Maitis. And it appears that, yes, it has. That decision has uh, acted as the last straw in, in a polarizing situation, in a situation where polarization 
where otherization of the cookie community, where distancing between the maites and the cookies were increasing in a particular context, in a context where the state, the state government of Manipur has an active role to play. Uh, so in that context, obviously, the granting of the attempt to grant status to the ST status to the Maitis has acted as the last straw. To understand uh, the context of the polarization, we have to understand that the, the fault lines have already existed because of several uh, structural reasons, structural reasons that cause unequal, that cause regional disparities in terms of the access to state facilities, uh, structural discrimination against the tribals. These have been the context. Uh, if we look at the uh, if we look at the uh, level of you know if we look at the development developmental parameters as uh, you know rights that citizens of India must have, we can see why Manipur as a state is uh, has much more level of poverty as compared to the uh, average of India. The level of poverty is much more in the hills. If we look at the avenues to help to education, we can see there is a glaring inequality. While Manipur as a state has been systematically discriminated uh, for the last so many years by Indian ruling parties. But at the same time, there is a regional dis uh, disparity between, uh, between the hills and the valley in Manipur itself. The major uh, medical institutions, the major educational institutions, even the tribal, the campus of the tribal university, it is situated in the valley. Why people in the hill, uh, they do not have uh, access to even you know primary health. They do not have access to higher education. And in the context of the school closures, it is the hill districts that have suffered uh, much more. They are the, uh, the while you know the uh, we we are seeing what the violence has done, what the conflict has done, what what the role of the state has done. Uh, there are if we if we just briefly you know discuss about the factors that are being that are being told as a reason for the conflict. If we uh, look at the land and economic interest uh, that has played as a cause in the present conflict. It, it, is a, it is a widely held belief, not only by the people of Manipur, from both communities, but also, you know, by uh, people who, who is watching over the present government. The fact that the hill areas of Manipur, in a way, the land in the hill areas are owned by communally by any uh, tribal society. So there is a widely held opinion that the government of India uh, wants to break down this communitarian land holding pattern and the government of India wa wants to uh, expose the huge mineral resources that the hills of Manipur are holding to multinational corporations, which is also very uh, evident from the other, from uh, the rest of the policies that the present government is following, like inviting foreign direct investment in our uh, crucial natural resources sector. Uh, so there is this, so while the present conflict had already had some historical fault lines, which includes the uh, inequality between the hills and the valleys, the discrimination faced by the tribal people, historical claims uh, uh, to the land of Manipur, and uh, a, a major a, a otherizing narrative uh, being pushed uh, by the state, like projecting the entire cookie community as illegal immigrants, as forest encroachers, as poppy cultivators. It is also very evident that uh, Manipur, it is also very evident to note that Manipur is pre being presently governed. The uh, government of Manipur is being run by BJP. And the BJP has claimed a track record of widening existing fault lines in the society, of polarizing the society based on community lines. We have seen in the rest of the country how the BJP plays its game to flare up communal hatred, hatred based on 
uh, religion, hatred against the Muslims, how the BJP has played a role in manufacturing riots in states after states, be it in Gujarat, be it in Uttar Pradesh, be it, be, not only the BJP, but the several other branches that uh, assist the BJP, like the Vishya Hindu Parishad, but like the RSS. And uh, while, unfortunately, while the uh, violence of Manipur uh, was being unleashed in front of humanity, there was also violence happening in Nu in Haryana, where the Vishwa Hindu Parishad had a very specific role to play in clearing up that violence. So, you know, while uh, concluding my part of the, uh, of the report presentation, uh, I would like to emphasize to the observation that the team has developed after a visit to Manipur, that the BJP and the state government also in association with the central government has a very specific role to play in flaring up the communal hatred, in flaring up the communal segregation, and in flaring up the conflict that has, that has caused so many lives in Manipur. Uh, Clifton, I am done. Yeah, thank you, uh, Suchetan. I think... Uh... One of the things that we really wanted to do was also to understand this violence, not just from what happened on 3rd, uh, but to also try and understand the kind of uh, uh, socioeconomic, uh, the political context, and perhaps also the political background uh, to this kind of violence. Because, uh, I mean, for us, it was absolutely, uh, you know, there's no two ways about it. It was uh, quite shocking, uh, the, the situation that we saw over there. And, you know, I, I just like to over here recall uh, one thing that uh, met the intellectual, in fact, what uh, she told us when we when we met her. And this is, there are sections uh, that that are extremely disturbed uh, by this by this violence and you would really like to see it, you know, end. So what she says is that we are all victims here, though the cookies have suffered more. Everyone is suffering, people are wounded. How are they going to stay together? The accommodating space that was Manipur is now destroyed. We, we, were, we, were, we are a state that has had tribal chief ministers, uh, Shaizu and Kaishing, and a Muslim chief minister, Muhammad Ali Mudin, in the past. I fear for the future of my state, Manipur, and its people. Is Manipur the next Kashmir? Will it be divided into three ethnic states? There are no sensible voices on either side. Courage is enough to speak the language of peace, justice, and reconciliation. I think the the one of the most uh, telling things about this violence has been the ethnic segregation. But before I go to that, what we've also tried to see is to understand uh, the narratives around how the uh, how the violence actually took place. And uh, besides the conversations that we had with uh, uh, you know scores of uh, people both in the valley and the hills, we were also given some amount of literature. So uh, when we went to the hills. Uh, we were given a copy of this report called The Inevitable Split, uh, Documents on State-Sponsored Ethnic Cleansing in Manipur. And uh, there were uh, people who we met uh, in Imphal who gave us another book, uh, another report called Cookie Lies, exposing the propaganda of the inevitable split. So basically, this is a question of reports and uh, counter-reports that, uh, that are being produced. And the one remarkable thing that is there is that uh, the, the sense of... Uh, hurt is so deep uh, that, that there is no possibility of acknowledging that the that there could be a hurt on the on the other side that seems to be something you know that uh, that we really came across so in this report what we have tried to do is to look at the narratives of violence that have emerged from these various uh, this various things and as sucheta said it broadly boils down to two you know to two uh, kind of uh, understandings one that uh, in so far as uh, you know, from the cookie side, what they, they think that you know, this has been uh, there has been this kind of a, uh, you know uh, a very very uh, discriminatory kind of a, a political setup that they have existed in all this while, which has relegated them uh, to to the to, to a to a position behind uh, the Maites, and they've consistently have to you know had to fight with this. And one of the demands was also that. Uh, you know, to for six scheduled status for the constitution to be given to the hill districts. And it is said that that was actually a few days from taking place before this violence uh, violence broke out. The claim is that um, uh, on the 3rd of May, there was a rally that was called. The rally went off peacefully. It's only when uh, the Maitais actually you know started attacking some of the cookies in various other villages that as a counter, the violence broke out over here, which is 
the the narrative that you hear from uh, from the Mehta side then is completely to the contrary, which is that uh, the third the third violence began in Churachandpur and other places where the uh, where the uh, tribal rally took place, and then as a kind of a counter to that, uh, there were violence that spread in other parts of Imphal. And also there was news spread that, you know, that uh, 37 women were raped in Chura Chandpur and people got extremely angry. Actually, this question of 37 women being raped, we heard about this in a couple of places. And uh, so we actually, uh, because we have done some bit of research before we went, and we also found that the police had immediately clarified it and the hospital had also clarified that this didn't take place. So when we, when we spoke to a couple of people in one of the camps and said that, see, this thing that you heard may not be true. Uh, because these are the kind of clarifications that we're given. The stock answer was that, you know, we really, we know what has happened and we know that this kind of a, uh, this kind of uh, uh, sexual violence has not only happened against the, against the cookies, it is something that actually began in uh, Chura Chandpur. So basically then you have this entire violence that takes place. Uh, we we went and met the family of uh, David Teak, who's from uh, 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 the Lamsa village in Chura Chandpur, and as most of us know, he's a 31-year-old man who was killed, who was beheaded rather, in the most uh, brutal fashion. And the kind of trauma that the family is still going to, they're just unable to recover from this kind of uh, violence. And in fact, every person you speak to, uh, that we spoke to either in the villages or in the camps, it is always a, a story of pain, of loss, of suffering, and a yearning of, of return. Every single person in the camps, be it in the valley or be it in the hills, really has their own story of you know the kind of uh, uh, the kind of uh, 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 violence and uh, threats and how they manage to escape. Uh, and of course, every single person will tell you that you know we only came with our with the clothes that we are wearing and we've lost everything. So when we when we are talking about the the violence, the violence has meant that there's been, com, you know, uh, houses have been completely demolished, burnt, arson uh, has taken place. There's been looting, so on and so forth. People have lost basically all their positions, and whatever little they had when they ran, that is uh, that is all you know uh, uh, that they have on them. So at the time that we went there, there were I think around sixty thousand people in camps across uh, the valley and the hills. And that's the number of people that now, you know, have lost their homes. Um, I'll come back to the the, the the ethnic segregation part. There are there are just a couple of other issues uh, which are very, very pressing for the people that we spoke to. So in uh, one of the things that we heard in in, uh, in uh, Churachandpur and Kankopi was about the 150 uh, dead persons uh, who were, whose bodies are still lying in the hospitals. Uh, two of those hospitals are in Imphal and one of those hospitals is in Chura Chandpur itself. Uh, but uh, that's 35 uh, uh, you know, bodies in uh, the Chura Chandpur hospital and the remaining in the hospitals in uh, in Imphal. Uh, but the organization of the of the tribal leaders had decided that unless we get all you know all the bodies are released to us, we are not going to be able to uh, you know uh, uh, have a dignified burial for them. Now this is an extremely uh, uh, very very sensitive issue is what we found. And like one young uh, cookie student volunteer told us that unless we're able to rest our dead in, you know, in with dignity, there is just no way that we can move forward from this. And what we found is that there's so much of battling happening over that as well. So the ITLF, the, uh, the Tribal uh, Leaders Forum, when they decided that, okay, because the weight for the bodies from, uh, from Impal was getting too much, they decided that they will bury the 35 uh, uh, bodies in the Chura Chandpur Medical College, and then there was a uh, the place that was selected became uh, you know became controversial. So some Maithe groups actually approached the High Court. There was a status quo order that was passed over there, and the factum of this order having been passed again is something that really affects the cookies. That you know we cannot even step into Imphal. We can't go to the High Court, and you have orders being passed against us. So that issue of the of the dead bodies and uh, the last point on that is one of the things that really rankles for the for the cookie community, at least the people who we met, was the statements being made in the uh, in the hearings before the Supreme Court, where the advocates appearing for the government of Manipur and for the Union of India, saying that they are bodies of that these are infiltrators. So that is something that you know that that is totally unacceptable uh, to whoever we met in the. Uh, in the in the hills, and they cautioned that the union government and the state of uh, the, the government of Manipur should definitely inform their advocates to be a little more sensitive 
in their submissions before the court. So that is one part, I think, you know, in terms of the aftermath of the of the violence. The second, of course, is the kind of attack on the religious places. Now, this is an extremely, you know, something that has garnered a lot of uh, attention. Uh, we met with uh, representatives of uh, the various uh, uh, Christian religious denominations in the valley and in the hills. And uh, we collected a fair amount of uh, documentation, including lists, uh, photographs, videos. Uh, we also visited some of the places. And you, uh, from what we, uh, from the documents that we've been able to collate, there are around 300 to 350 uh, religious uh, places belonging to Christians, churches, prayer halls, etc., that have been uh, that have been uh, uh, vandalized, that have been burnt, and in some cases have been completely uh, razed to the ground. Uh, the thing that we also saw, in fact, on the way to uh, Kankopi, just before you enter Kankopi, we also found that there was a Maitre temple that had been uh, that had been uh, uh, raised to the ground and. We, of course, you know, made inquiries about it and we found that apparently there were 11, uh, 11 uh, Maite temples that have been vandalized. Uh, incredibly, when we were in uh, Churachandpur, there was a temple that was still functional. And so we went there and we found, we asked, you know, how is it that uh, we've been hearing that temples are being demolished everywhere? How is it that this temple has not been demolished? People said, you know, this is this temple has been here for a while, so no one's really going to touch it. But then, what we heard later on in the uh, in the Imphal Valley, when we related the story to uh, some of the uh, uh, human rights activists over there, they told us that maybe the Churachandpur temple is a Nepali temple, and which is why that has not been touched. But uh, I think you know that uh, these are question of facts. But the point is that religious places have been have been uh, uh, badly damaged, particularly of the Christian community. And the videos that we've seen, you can you can see the kind of vandalizing that's taken place. And it's not just cookie churches; also Mete churches have been uh, have been uh, demolished and have been vandalized. And one thing that is being said is that this shows that there was definitely in, this is a, if you say that this is only an ethnic conflict, it is an ethnic conflict where there are strong elements of a communal angle to the violence. The other part uh, that I really there are two other parts that are there in this. One is on the sexual violence and the others, uh, which uh, again, you know, uh, uh, this we all know about. It is something that has shocked all of us. And um, uh, we actually, when we were in, uh, when we were in the hills, we did not go and meet uh, uh, with the survivors because, uh, you know, by then they had already given a couple of interviews with the newspapers and we didn't want to give them too much of uh, trauma from our side. Uh, at the time that we were in the, uh, in the valley, we were uh, we received news that there was a a, a Maite woman had come forward and filed a complaint that uh, uh, you know saying that she was raped when she was in Churachandpur. She was in one of the relief camps in Bishnupur. We actually tried to go and meet her, but then uh, we were told that she is not in a position to talk to anyone. So really, that's something that we could not do. But the sexual violence is something that is inescapable in so far as the Manipur uh, thing, uh, the entire incident is concerned. The other uh, aspect, of course, is the arms and ammunition. Now, how are people really arming themselves? And here, one of the most shocking things we heard was of how arms are actually have been stolen from police stations, armories, etc., etc. And these are not in small numbers. According to a press brief of the government of Manipur on 10th of June, the number of uh, the arms that have that were uh, that the arms that were stolen is in the uh, in the area of 4,500. The ammunition is more than 6 lakhs and this is only on 10th June. There have been other reports where other, uh, you know, armories have been, have been, uh, have been uh, robbed. So you're talking about a very high level of sophisticated uh, weapons that are now in circulation in the valley and the hills. And that is a matter of obviously great, great concern. Uh, now, the part I really, I, I want to just talk about for a couple of minutes and then we'll move on to the next part is the question of ethnic segregation. I don't know if you if you all you know if you all read the news the a couple of days ago, uh, but the uh, under sixteen Indian football team actually won the South Asian Football Federation Championship, and there were uh, there are a couple of uh, players who are from Manipur who were in the team a Mete and a Cookie, and they won the tournament. But on when they go back, the Mete kid actually flies back to Imphal, but the 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 young boy who's from the Cookie community, his name is. Nam Namgahu Mate, 
he actually has to go to dimapur then from dimapur take the long convoluted route back to uh, to uh, uh, kangpopi where he goes to a relief camp he's in a relief camp as of now and uh, with his uncle and the the house that the, his family had in imphal has been completely demolished he cannot go visit his family at this point because they are in uh, Uh, Tengnopal in one of the camps over there, and that means that he'll have to cut through the valley, which is not possible. Now, why is that not possible? Is the question of ethnic segregation that, for all practical purposes, now the Kuki community is is confined to the hills, the Metes are confined to the to the valley, and you have very strict, you know, checks that are being uh, carried out by the communities themselves to prevent any kind of a any kind of a, Uh, entry or uh, in, uh, you know of somebody from that community into either of these uh, these areas uh, we were also given to understand that you know this this thing that happened it's it's also that the police that you know the state also kind of uh, uh, facilitated this so when the entire violence broke out in the name of saving people from certain areas they were taken to army camps and from the army camps they were brought into uh, relief camps in the hills if you were kuki and if you were maithe then you were brought into relief camps in the in the valley so by this movement of people you have an entire segregation now that is taking place and because of the kind of checks that are being carried out by civil society organizations including organizations like the uh, mera paibis you cannot have any movement of these of people from either community into each of these areas so broadly now you have between the hills and the valley it's there's a border for all practical purpose it is a border because it, it there are checkpoints there are you know there are concentina wires over there there's the army over there and then uh, if you're going from the valley on this side you have the uh, the maithe community you know volunteers who are ensuring who are checking where you're going why are you going and then on the other side you have the kuki uh, women volunteers who are also checking you also have uh, you know uh, given to understand that you have bunkers in various villages there are enough number of news reports of that you have firing that is taking place so this is a a line of control within a state in the in the in, in india that is the kind of uh, segregation that has happened and alongside that is a is a blockade and really this is one of the most uh, one of uh, again another very disturbing thing that we learned which is that uh, there's a complete blockade of any kind of material from the valley from the valley to the hills so no relief material no food material no medicines nothing can be taken either by the uh, government authorities or the police or the army from the valley into the hills it is blocked at various points by the uh, by representatives of the uh, of the meta of the maithi community including the mera paibis and we are also given to understand that there have been times when the there's been a the blockade of the highways by the kukis themselves which then prevents things from coming into the uh, into the valley and if anyone wants to then go to the valley the only way for them out to fly so this undeclared blockade this ethnic segregation this has created a situation of a complete ethnic divide and a growing hatred which is cultivated on an everyday basis in the in the valley and i mean frankly if this is the situation that has come you know after 3 months of uh, of of violence with a government which you know bjp government at the center bjp government at the state so they really cannot be that you know that the government is not listening to you it is your government in both places this is a you know this is really a demonstration of the abject failure on the one hand or a design on the on the other the last part in so in the in this violence and the aftermath is the relief camps i am requesting uh, uh, my colleagues uh, uh, madhulika and pratima ji to please uh, take over from here thanks clifton so one of the searing images that stuck with the team from our pore visit to manipur was one the abysmal state of the relief camps across the state and the conditions of the people at the camps and to the complete and utter loss of hope of people we met at the camps for a better future or even a short term political solution to their problems we visited about seven camps across four districts two in anfal one in moirang one in kanpokpi and three in chirachandpur and the camps similar to the state are completely divided on ethnic lines at anfal we visited two camps the akampat relief camp and the shamsaki relief camps which were both housed at educational premises they were predominantly run by civil society organizations on funds that were also raised by civil society organizations 
There was government support, but very, very minimal government support. The camp convener informed us that the government supports them with about rupees 80 per inmate per day, apart from giving some rice and dal. But he was very quick to add that this is very, very insufficient to keep the camp running. Similarly, in Moirang, we visited a camp that was housed in a marketplace. And here too, the camp was mainly dependent on civil society funds. And again, very minimal support from the state. And when you go and you move to Churachanpur and Kanpok, you see a completely different story. Um, we visited um, three camps at Churachanpur. Maybe it was just the camps we visited, but all three camps that we visited were not in government buildings. We had one camp that was functioning out of a youth hostel, one that was in a community hall, and third from a church. And in contrast to the Methi camps, the state was completely absent at the cookie camps. People have been completely dependent on the community, on local churches and NGOs to get by. And all provisions, be it food, be it medicines, have been completely crowdsourced by the people um, and by the community. In a sense, if, if we have to say, after serving the camps, both the cookie and the methe camps, what we can say with certainty is the state has completely abandoned both the communities to fend for themselves. People at relief camps in Manipur are getting by or hardly in fact getting by. It's only and only because the community, their community has come through for them and not because of the state. Um, now, since several of the issues we noticed cut through different camps, I'll just quickly run through the critical areas of concern that we've uh, pointed to in our report, starting one with nutrition. So we were told at uh, camps at Kanpokki, Churachanpur, and Moiran that only by a meal that consists of dal and rice is served twice a day to people at the camp. There are no vegetables that is served. There's no meat that is provided. And what we were told is that without nutritious food, several people at the camps have, have begun to fall sick quite regularly. And a camp volunteer at Churachanpur also informed us that dietary changes have had profound impacts on lactating mothers at the relief camps who, due to this sudden change in diet, have been unable to feed their children. At Akampat Relief Camp, which is in Imphal, we were told that the meals are slightly better. We were told that people at the camp uh, are served vegetables. They also get meat perhaps once a week. But there was also a young mother who met us at the Akampat Relief Camp who was sharing her disdain at not being able to even provide her young four-year-old daughter with as much as a biscuit when she's hungry in the evening. The second critical area of concern that we noticed at the camps was sanitation and living conditions. Living conditions, especially at the Churachanpur camps are squalid. We found several families that were huddled together in extremely small rooms. Toilets are in complete short supply. There, were, there was a camp that we visited in Churachanpur where over 200 inmates were forced to depend on just two toilets. We were told of long queues every morning to just use the toilet. Um, we were also spoke, we were also told about heavy problems that they're facing with waste disposal, which is one of the reasons why diseases have begun to spread very, very quickly across camps. At the Akampat Relief Camp in uh, Imphal, in fact, the team noticed that the garbage was being, um, the, the garbage was right next to the makeshift, uh, makeshift camp where they were making food for the inmates. The same, I mean, the same story, but worse in Churachanpur, where we were told that garbage cups camps, uh, they come perhaps once in two weeks to collect uh, garbage because of which there's, there's, there's a lot of garbage piles that come up. Closely related to this is the health um, situation at the, the camps, which is again abysmal. At the ITI camp in Kanpokpi, at the relief camp in Kanpokpi, we were told that because because of a lack of medical personnel at the sole functioning district hospital, the entire district of Kanpokpi has one district hospital, that no medical team from the state has been able to visit anyone at the relief camp. The team was told that the only medical attention that the displaced persons at the camp have received since May has been from um, doctors that NGOs have brought to the camp. Um, we were told that there's 
a high incidence of people in the camps who are suffering from typhoid, from diarrhea, from fever, and from stools. In relief camps, it was much of the same story. Again, due to the congested nature of the camps, the team was told that measles, chickenpox, and viral fever has begun to spread like wildfire. There are no quarantine rooms or isolation, ward, uh, isolation wards as a result of which people with those diseases don't have a separate uh, place to stay. Even at Churachandpur, we were told that um, there, the, there's a huge strain on existing hospitals in Churachandpur because of which doctors and medical professionals are unable to provide any adequate attention to camps in addition to their hospital duties. Like I mentioned before, infrastructure, especially at the camps in Churachandpur, it's completely broken, in fact. The youth hospital, the youth hostel, my apologies, the team visited was completely falling apart. There were broken windows, there were no safety rails. The other community hall where another camp is, the team found that there's no closed windows to protect the inmates from rains. In fact, inmates had hung makeshift plastic covers to protect them from winds and rains. And even that was peeling off when we had visited the camp. Um, what we noticed uh, across camps was women, and this is both the Methi and the Kuki camps, were women and children huddled into small groups, giving them no privacy. Women spoke to us of several difficulties they had while changing clothes, while changing pads, and how the only privacy that they're able to secure for themselves is these thin cloth partitions that they've put up. Now, having interacted with the people at the camps, what we've understood is that people at these camps are overcome by grief, overwhelming grief of having lost their homes, their livelihoods, and their lives. People shared poignant stories with us of fleeing from violence, of hiding in the forests, of arduous journeys that they undertook to reach the relief camps. Some people even told us that they traveled over three days just on foot to reach safety. And almost all conversations inevitably ended with people sharing their fear and their uncertainty about what the future holds for them. Um, having close, having lived at the camps for close to three months at that point of time and now four, I think the big question that was looming for the people at the camps and also for us was what comes next? Was the stay of these people at the camps going to be indefinite? Could they return home? Was there a home to return to? And most importantly, as one of the um, women at the Akampat Relief Camp asked me, what is the government doing? What is the government's plan? So um, with that, I'll ask Comrade Pratibha to give her uh, thoughts on her visit. Thanks. Thank you, Madhulika. Pratibha ji? The team uh, consisting of eight members, we went to Manipur and then we visit uh, in relief camps in Kangkokpi and also Churachanpur and also the Veli area that is Samasaki and the Akampat relief camp. So my colleague uh, Modulka has told about all this uh, uh, facing the women and uh, all people facing in the relief camps. There uh, we came to know uh, that uh, in the relief camp, they don't have sufficient uh, food and also not uh, uh, in medical facilities also there. And one lady gave birth a baby in a Samasaki uh, relief camp. She's from Meite community. And then uh, after that, uh, we went to um, Churachanpur and that condition just uh, Madhulka has told, in a youth hostel, the broken uh, building, about uh, four and five hundred inmates live there. So uh, you think the condition, when the conflict has uh, started, then all the people from both sides, uh, from Kuki side and also the Meite side, they suffered a lot. And about uh, 60,000 people were displaced and all these people were living in very 
uh, trouble conditions and the relief came in Charachanpur. Some uh, self-help group and some religion, religious uh, organization run the relief camp. And the local local people at that area, they run the relief camp. And they don't get from any governmental uh, uh, materials like uh, uh, for the relief inmates. And they also told that from um, Mizoram side, Mizoram government also helped them in the Churachanpur area. And in Kangpok, we, uh, we have seen there that uh, they don't have any much medical facilities and that, uh, and in, uh, Valley area when we visit the uh, accompanied relief camp, uh, college, uh, go, girls, girls college is there. But uh, so many people in th that accompanied relief camp, they were from uh, Moray side, the bordering area, and all their houses were burned and they uh, flew away there. And their conditions is not good. Uh, uh, you think uh, in every violence, while uh, we see the inmates, the people, both the community, they are facing very trouble in life, and they 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 want to go their place. But uh, when will the government provide them? Uh, security and the uh, house to uh, live there. This is the main uh, problems in uh, Manipur. So now uh, about uh, four months is running there. So when the government, and Biren Singh government and the central government uh, they say that when the double engine government is there, then all, uh, everything will be okay. But now we have seen in Manipur, the uh, ethnic cleansing is happening there. So the tribal peoples in the hills and the valley people, they uh, various reasons. They may, it may be political reason, it may be ST status, and maybe the uh, other, uh, uh, that is uh, poppy cultivation and infiltration. But the people, both the community, they suffering a lot. So we uh, ask the government, then how will they run such a condition? Uh, in the border community. So in Northeast, when we'll go to uh, see the uh, different communities, different tribals are living in Northeast, but the uh, central government, they want to, uh, uh, in Northeast, uh, uh, conflict zone, they want to uh, conflict zone in Northeast. Like uh, uh, Assam, Assam and uh, uh, Mizoram and Meghalaya, the bordering problems are, is there in uh, Assam and Meghalaya and Assam and Arunachal, like this. So uh, the main problem is from the central government. So uh, they are uh, immediately they they have to control all this segregation and all this violence and stop all this uh, ethnic cleansing and uh, restore peace and normalcy life of uh, in Manipur also. Thank you, Pratimaji. Thank you, Madhulika. Uh, just two more parts left and then uh, we'll throw it open. One of the things that we've also done is uh, uh, try to understand uh, uh, what is the people's views uh, in regard to the role played by the various actors in this, in, in what is taking place over there, whether it's the 
the governments at the at Manipur or at the center, uh, the armed forces, the police, and of course various other communities over there. So one of the things that was remarkable is that there's one consensus across the board in whoever we spoke to. They blame the union government and the state government for the current state of affairs. The degree that they would blame them depends. Uh, but the fact remains that all of them believe that this is something that could have been stopped. This kind of violence did not have to go on for so long. And even now, if the union government and the state government are actually serious about it, addressing this issue, they can very well address this issue and put an end to the violence. But that has not uh, happened at all. Uh, one of the people that we spoke to was uh, Brinda Taunajam, who's, uh, she was with the IPS and very famously uh, she resigned from the IPS when she, uh, when she basically revealed uh, the, the kind of stakes that even the BJP has in the drug cartelization that's happening in Manipur, where some, somebody really big eye up in the drug, uh, one of the uh, drug peddlers was caught and was forced to be released because of pressure that came from the uh, various uh, uh, you know, office bearers of that party. So what she says is this, she says, prior to 3rd May, the chief minister was going to be changed due to internal problems and the violence erupted. The chief minister could have sent troops to control. BJP is talking about Hindu Rashtra and playing with fire in Manipur. They want to break up Manipur, but what they will actually achieve is the balkanization of India. Manipur burns and the prime minister went to France and where not. In fact, no one spoke of Manipur except until the video came out. Now, this is a view that you will find across. One is that how is it that, uh, you know, Prime Minister Modi had time to go all over the world, but did not have time to, uh, to, uh, to go to Manipur, he still not gone to Manipur. And the only time he's spoken about it is when the video, uh, when the video, of course, uh, uh, came out. So this anger that is there against the, the state and the union government is very clear. But I think one of the, the activists in the hills, she put it very succinctly as to what is the design of the state, uh, the BJP government. I mean, it's for all practical purposes, it's the BJP government in both places. She says, there are subplots in a larger design of the double-engine government to displace the accountability that they ought to be subjected to and to deepen the hatred between the cookies and the methis to such an extent that the BJP governments at the center and the state ex escape blame and instead the other community is identified as the enemy. So this is, again, you know, some kind of uh, view that we heard over there. The second, uh, I think, point that we're making here, which is inescapable, is the role of the Arambai Tengol and the Mete Lupin. Across the board, yeah, whether it is cookie organizations or Mete organizations, the centrality of the role played by these Shavonist organizations is inescapable. The extent of what their, their participation is, their involvement, etc., that may be, up, you know, debatable. But it is no one's case that that you know the, i mean it's everyone's case that these two organizations had a very very central role to play in the violence that has taken place in manipur and in fact there are uh, there are enough number of you know documentary proof that is put out to show that they have access to the top uh, of uh, of the bjp and that they are uh, you know that basically uh, they are a bjp promoted uh, organization so that is something also that we kind of looked at uh, uh, in the report and here, one thing that 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 we were repeatedly told was that for the Arambai Tengol and for Mete Lupin, the communalism is one of their key planks. So here, you know, I think what we what we were asked is, you think for yourself, why is it that 350 churches were burnt? If this was just an ethnic conflict, then why were the churches burnt? And why were Mete churches burnt? And the explanation that was given to us was that these organizations have been consistently trying to rake up the communal issue over there. So, for instance, uh, they're talking about Sanamaism, which is the original uh, the religion of the Mehtes, and they've been saying that Mehte Christians who are around 1.25 lakhs to 1.75 lakhs, that if they want to uh, uh, survive, they have to come back, you know, do a Garwa Pisi to Sanamaism. So, this communal kind of a, uh, kind of a uh, nature of these organizations is also something that is that has come to the fore. And their central role in this violence is inescapable. Uh, the third aspect is the Sioux groups. That is basically the suspension of operations uh, agreements that the that the union government, state government have with uh, with the cookie uh, armed groups. Uh, this has been going on from 2005. So through agreements that have been entered into with these uh, with these uh, uh, militant organizations, they stay in camps. Their arms are under uh, lock and key, and they're not supposed to engage in any. Uh, 
uh, any kind of activity which is you know violence or any anti state kind of activity now repeatedly what you we have heard is that the su groups are behind the uh, violence so these were the militants who were there in all those videos carrying the sophisticated arms of the th in the 3rd uh, may uh, rally and uh, what we tried to uh, find out more about this and one of the things that we found was that uh, that you know that definitely uh, you know uh, the their role is inescapable but what, to what extent i think is a question that we really cannot uh, you know answer given the uh, at least in so with regard to the information that we were able to cover uh, there's also the question on the role of the mira pebis but uh, one of my colleagues she's going to speak about this so i'm not going to uh, speak on that uh, the last point in this there's also the what the nagas the pangals which is the mete muslims what role they are playing but uh, i'm also going to talk about uh, of the, uh, the the role of the armed forces now here is a is a very very stark situation so you any talk with somebody in the valley you would come up that the assam rifles are siding with the cookies those armed forces are siding with the cookies any conversation in the hills you will find that see the police commandos uh, irb etc they are all siding with the metes they are not a neutral force so there is no uh, no sense of uh, of belief in regard to any of the forces the security forces that are operating in in uh, in uh, in in manipur by everyone i mean there's lots of stories that we heard where uh, fires and counter fires have been filed between the police and the assam rifles we have not gone into that we have only stuck to the testimonies uh, that we uh, we heard and lastly uh, uh, we also had a meeting with the uh, with the, with the governor of manipur like i said where we uh, where we briefed her in great detail about what was what we have seen and the very very disturbing situation Uh, to be fair to her she actually uh, agreed with what we were saying because that's common knowledge ethnic uh, ethnic uh, segregation is common knowledge armed uh, that there are arms floating around it's common knowledge that there is uh, violence that can break out at any point is a lived reality that there is a undeclared blockade is a lived reality so these all lived realities over there so she had no dispute in regard to that but she said one thing you know it will be really good if uh, if uh, communities can uh, you know uh, organizations from can start talking to each other and building some kind of a uh, bridge over there very interestingly after we met her we didn't know this but when we came back we learned that uh, she actually tweeted about the meeting uh, that we had and uh, uh, quite uh, you know recorded faithfully what you know we had actually the issues that we raised with her in those tweets you know it's it's part of the part of the report so this is broadly the kind of views that are there of the various you know play, uh, people who have a stake in this entire dispute now i i'd request uh, uh, do saraswati uh, to please talk about the the role of the mira pai bees hum good evening everybody uh yes sir see you your order yeah. please go on yeah uh the three four point to make you know uh, after visiting uh, manipur is uh, actually personally it was very heavy for me the two images that keeps coming to my mind is uh, this um, iman anbi and others you know who protested against assam rifle saying come on indian army rape us because manorama was brutally murdered and raped um and she was thrown on the uh, street and now you know two cookie women have been brutally assaulted and uh, they were uh, raped so this disturbed me a lot and uh, when we went to manipur in fact you know the amount of women, i mean uh, the the big numbers you know the women were there in the markets it uh, looked as though the whole economy is built by uh, women and we also came to know about the history of women fighting you know uh, since uh, the british imperialism how they protected their uh, men you know of the free labor which they were uh, doing for the british and uh, how they you know stopped uh, blocked uh, uh, the donkeys which were carrying the rice when they were hungry uh, it was carried out of manipur how they stopped with this history what is happening Uh, uh i was really disturbed 
um, even to this day, I am unable to digest, you know, the kind of violence that has uh, taken place there. The complete segregation, you know, both of them are, you know, like um, they are. Uh, I don't know how the peace talk can happen, and they are not ready to sit uh, with each other and, uh, um, you know, talk. With these two segregated groups, the three common things which uh, I came to know, you know, while talking to them. One is both the side, they said, uh, the state could have stopped this violence if they wished, if they had the political uh, will. And uh, uh, the second thing is both the relief camps um, both in the hills and uh, the valley, it is completely taken care uh, uh, by the civil society groups, not the state. All that they are giving is only the just rice and the potato. Um, so this speaks the truth. The state, uh, which had the power to control this violence, has not done that. And it is not even taking care of the people who are in the camps. It is actually, it is uh, so very painful to see the young mothers. There was in one camp, uh, a woman had given birth uh, to uh, uh, a baby girl. And the baby girl is named after the same relief camp. I can't uh, recollect the name of the uh, uh, camp. Um, and the children who are affected by that, this is very alarming. One woman in uh, Imphal uh, relief camp, she had a small little daughter. When the mother was speaking again and again, the, uh, uh, the girl was stopping the mother to not to talk. So she just hit the baby. I said, why are you hitting? You know, don't hit. She said, you know, after seeing this violence, agar main means you know the, you can imagine you know, you know the kind of uh, um, you know the uh, psychological effect this violence has created among the children this is very alarming and they don't go to the school in some of the relief camps they have tried to accommodate this uh, uh, children in the um, uh, nearby schools uh, and they don't have the work in the camp. They are given the place to stay and they are given food, but uh, they don't have the job. And uh, the little bit which uh, the groups which are trying is, you know, okay, ask them to do some handicraft thing and, you know, sell. They were selling the agarbatis and uh, small little handicraft uh, items. They were uh, doing it and selling, but how long they are going to stay there? All of them told, we want to go back. We want to go back just, you know, cannot, just uh, not with the house. What they have lost, they have lost their business, they have lost their property, they have lost their uh, uh, documents, and how they are going to uh, build their life again, unless until some assurance is uh, uh, given, to, uh, given to them. And both the sites, you know, we met few people. I came back with the hope, both from Koki and Maitai sites. They have tried to save the opposite groups. Uh, one uh, lecturer, she tried, you know, try, uh, uh, you know, keeping all the documents which the Koki students have left, and you know, safely, you know, uh, some twenty-seven Koki students, you know, how she managed to send them out of uh, Imphal, and here also. And one, in, I think in Assam, we met, you know, there are uh, there are some more than 300 families who have taken shelter in uh, Assam. Uh, there, one person we met, he was telling, when I was running for my life, somebody came to, you know, help me out. Uh, they were, they belong to Maitai family. Very genuinely, they tried to offer the help. But there was a doubt in my mind. Should I trust or not trust? So this kind of complete mistrust between the group, I think the state has played a very major role in building this. And uh, the kind of uh, developmental disparity uh, that is you know, blatant, 
in kangpokwi we saw the district hospital for the name sake it is the district hospital and uh, there is not even a bandage material there and all the people who are there the nurse the receptionist and the doctors whoever is there they are taking care of these patients in one of the camp uh, uh, a person who required a, a dialysis um, who was given the uh, technical help has gone back to imphal and uh, you can't even call back because all the internet is cut off the phones are cut off so that person died because uh, he did not get the Uh, dialysis and if any um, delivery has to take uh, has to be done if it is going to be a cesarean they can't do it because the surgeons have ran back to uh, imphal and they have to send them to either to senapati or to other state which is just you know four five uh, you know very tedious journey because it's a hill it is very difficult and um, um, the, the small little things you know they they really need good health care they really need some kind of counseling for their uh, 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 trauma which uh, the children have undergone which this women have uh, uh, undergone when they were uh, running out for their life they have seen from the hillside how their houses have been um, uh, burnt how you know they have they have just gone with the clothes and their body not taking any records um so uh, this uh, and uh, it it has happened to everyone we met one uh, you know ex judge she has run away from imphal to her village leaving her house she, she don't even know what has happened to her uh, house and um, the, in uh, churachandpur also uh, the in the relief uh, uh, camp in bishnupur we uh, uh, i think in imphal they but all these people who are in the relief camps are not um, you know big people who who are doing some small uh, business who are working in office uh, uh, you know uh, to earn their uh, uh, livelihood and um, that person was telling in imphal um, see they used to sell rice they used to sell vegetables they used to sell petrol and they used to take rice from myanmar and sell it here and take the vegetables from manipur to uh, you know myanmar and sell it and he was selling uh, like you know that the rice from myanmar is uh, you know it is tasty and if you eat little you know your stomach will be filled so if you the why i am telling this is you know the demonization you know that uh, they are infiltrators and uh, they are uh, forest uh, encroachers and this poppy cultivators if you look deeply into it uh, some of i mean we met one ex police officer there we also met a journalist and with the records he was telling this lacks of infiltrators which is not true at the most it must be some thousands and who are these people who are coming they are not you know big uh, traders or big uh, businessmen you know what is happening in myanmar has made them you know in search of food and uh, job they have come to myanmar and this encroachment this whole koki people they have their own mechanism they don't they, they don't have the individual owning the land is owned collectively by the people it is the village headman who Uh, owns the land not each and every one according to their fancy they can uh, have this and coming back to this poppy cultivation who are the people who are dying again you know some maitai intellectuals we met they are poor farmers who are doing the cultivation and who is making profit out of this the big people and uh, the ex police officer uh, uh, that woman brinda we met uh, we came to know from many people Uh, the uh, the ruling uh, uh, bjp chief minister has the connection and these are the poor farmers who are growing the poppy and they don't have any economic alternatives so uh, all these things you know infiltration or desh ke naam par kar rahe hai they you know the big patriotism the drug they are telling you know ki they are spoiling uh, you know the young generation which is you know all are there the many people have financed uh, this uh, poppy cultivation and this encroachment 
you, you can't uh, i mean they have a very strong cultural root where they cannot own the land individually so all these th three things which are used for demonizing uh, speaks you know whether uh, this is the ethnic cleansing or the communal war which uh, the right wing people are um, um, waging and uh, coming back to um, this uh, Meera Pebis, we went and uh, uh, met uh, Iman Anbi, who uh, she had come to Karnataka also for uh, one of our 8th March uh, uh, rally. Um, actually, they are militant. I mean, both the sides, women are there, uh, you know, guarding their uh, boundaries. As Cl Clifton rightly said, there is army, there is police, and there is this uh, local army. Um, uh, they are militant. They want to protect their dignity. They want to fight for their rights. But unless and until this is not connected with the larger issue of, uh, you know, connecting with the fights of uh, the people who are fighting for inequality, this will be like, you know, key, um, um, like uh, I feel all these things again and again it was coming you know okay, the state the community the society in which women are made targets of violence women are used as pawns women are used as tool to uh, mm -hmm. as a weapon uh, to fight so this was very uh, you know disturbing uh, factor uh, for me because the uh, i think there were teenage boys and girls who were holding uh, uh, weapons in their hands and there was one girl we met you know she was telling and okay, i have tried, I, I am also learning didi how to um, uh, you know fill the banduk with the uh, bullets because uh, we have to protect in the name of protection uh, you know what kind of segregation is happening it is uh, something which is very uh, very very uh, disturbing so um, uh, I, I feel at this point of time, when the two people are separated completely, but two people want to get back to their homes, they want uh, the peace and they want to live there. Uh, I think the third party intervention is very much uh, necessary because this Eastern part of India is completely neglected. It is only, it comes, you know, only on 26th January, we are completely unaware of what is happening there, the kind of, uh, um, uh, the kind of violence which is happening. And uh, the whole concept of, you know, the state and how the annexure has taken place after the independence, where, you know, people's consent was not taken, you know, uh, um, the, uh, the, uh, the question of state and the question of uh, um, nationhood, how it is closely linked with patriarchy should be addressed, uh, I feel. Thank you, Sarsi. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, I think we're, we're just uh, running now a little uh, behind schedule. There are just two more parts. Uh, one is... Uh, uh, we've also looked at, uh, try to get in touch with, you know, to, to try and understand the situation of access to justice, what's happened to the lawyers in this entire uh, violence, and uh, which uh, our colleague uh, Avani Chokshi will talk about. And after that, we, we have just uh, the summarizing and the a very short part on the recommendations. So I request you to please bear with us. I think we should be able to finish this in the next uh, 10 minutes, at least from our side, so that we can have some interaction. Uh, Avni, please, can you take it? Uh, thank you, Clifton. I'll be speaking about the impact of on access to justice of this entire conflict. Now, we saw that after this, subsequent to this, uh, this conflict, there was a huge number of cases of bodily harm and injury, as well as destruction and vandalization of houses and other property. And consequent to these, uh, these crimes, FIRs had been registered, which are called zero FIRs. Since due to the seg ethnic segregation, most of the Kuki community were in the in the hill region and most of the Maitre community was in the valley region. They went to their respective police stations and got zero FIRs registers. 
which was sent to the jurisdictional police station. But every single person we spoke to had doubts on the investigation consequent to the registration of FIR, since they were not able to get any update whatsoever. Usually during investigation of FIRs, a mahazar, a spotter investigation is conducted where the victim is required to be present. And without the presence, this uh, the everyone we spoke to had doubts on whether these affairs would reach their logical conclusion and whether they would get justice for the crimes they had faced. Now, this was an apprehension on both sides. When uh, we spoke to the superintendent of police in Kangpokpi, which is a hill area, he said that an independent force would be created to meet the complainants and uh, the police stations on both sides would coordinate. But the people we spoke to said they were unable to get any updates whatsoever. The time we went was also just at the time when uh, uh, the Supreme Court had intervened and had uh, sought for constitution of this three judges committee. But this too was viewed with hesitation by members of both communities. We also saw that the, the conflict has had a massive impact on the functioning of courts. Uh, at the outset, we have to see that there is a concentration of courts in Imphal, with the only high court being in Imphal, as well as various specialized courts, such as the Consumer Forum, etc., being only in Imphal. There's also a lack of uh, tribal representation in the higher judiciary. But when we went, uh, which was al already three months into the conflict, only criminal matters were being taken up in the single district uh, court in Kangpokpi, family matters, civil matters, no other ma matters had started to be taken up. There are also two central jails, both of which are in Manipur, a women's jail, uh, jail and a men's jail. And so cookie inmates who are present in those jails were not able to come out despite receiving bail. Uh, so this was something which was highlighted by members of the cookie community. The situation of judges also was shocking. And we saw that uh, on an affidavit, the Manipur Tribal Forum has placed before the Supreme Court that as many as five cookie judges were forced to flee their homes and despite requesting for aid from the uh, High Court, they did not receive any aid. We also spoke to advocates in Manipur to see what, what the situation is. Now, as I said, they, uh, people pointed out to the lack of representation in the High Court, uh, lack of tribal representation. First of all, there's no tribal judge but also of almost 30 senior designated senior advocates, there's only one member of the Naga community and not a Uh, I, I think uh, I think uh, we had some some technical it's, it just got switched off so I'll just request Avani to continue. Yeah, sorry. Um, so most of the cookie advocates who were, were traveling to Imphal to uh, to uh, practice in Imphal, they had to give up their files, and most of them apparently have given up their files to member of the Naga community. They tried to attend court online through VC in some cases but there are massive internet issues due to the internet ban. So we saw that there's a serious livelihood crisis of lawyers. The last point I want to highlight is the fact that lawyers of the Maiti community who sought to represent cookie persons before the before courts of law are now unsafe. And we in fact saw many reports that a lawyer who represented a cookie professor, his house was vandalized and several of them had to withdraw from representing him in court. So this has a severe impact on the right of uh, right to be represented in court, as well as the right of lawyers to practice. Uh, I'll close with that, Clifton. Yeah, thank you. Actually, one while we were while this was going on, uh, also got a message from one of the people who is attending this, but didn't want to message directly on the group. That uh, one of the aspects is the uh, what's going to happen to the properties of uh, of uh, the cookie properties that are left in Imphal. 
uh, and uh, he was saying that you know it's, it, there's a situation where uh, now people you know uh, some Mete people over there started to occupy uh, properties of the cookies as well. Uh, this is something that even we heard here while we're in the valley of where uh, of course this is on both sides the cookies and his Mete is that you know the that their property which they've left behind either in their village or in the town has now been completely destroyed or it's in the occupation of somebody else. Another thing that was said was that uh, where specifically this advocate in uh, Kankopi told us was that uh, a lot of cases now coming where properties of the cookies which were given on rent, they, they, they have stopped receiving rent from the, uh, from the people living who have, who have uh, who live, you know, who they had given their properties on rent to. So there are, it's just a host of very complicated everyday issues uh, that really, you know, that that's a result of this conflict and the total failure of the of the state. But there's also the issue of the internet ban, which we have covered in our report, but we are not going to go into that because of uh, the lack of time. So I'm just going to summarize now some of the uh, some of the various, uh, uh, you know, what we really saw. I think, you know, uh, as one person in uh, Kankopi, if I'm not mistaken, is the same uh, magistrate uh, that we met uh, in uh, in uh, in this uh, lovely village, I forget the name, uh, where she told us that everyone has suffered, but the cookies have suffered more than those in the valley because they are fighting on two fronts, against the state government and the dominant majority community. And among the Metes, it is mostly the poor who have suffered. Whereas among the cookies, all have suffered in this ethnic, uh, the state-sponsored ethnic uh, cleansing. So, really, if you, if you know, if you look at the kind of uh, the kind of views that are there, the kind of ang you know anguish that you really hear in every single statement, every single conversation over there, it uh, like Sarsi said, it really makes you uh, think, you know, about how to what extent uh, there is this uh, failure over there. Uh, the scale and design of the violence has resulted. In, an, in the unprecedented, complete ethnic segregation of the Methi and Kuki communities into the valley and the hills of Manipur, respectively. The BJP with Modi at the center and Biren Singh in Manipur have the, uh, have the enormous uh, credit of overseeing the complete decimation of Manipur's social fabric, resulting in entire communities being totally ethnically segregated. The BJP government has manufactured the segregation in a state which, despite previous conflicts, was able to reconcile and live together. And this is something that came up repeatedly, that, you know, you have the uh, the very the, you know, infamous uh, Kukinaga Naga conflicts that began in 92, uh, that go on till uh, 1995, and there were several Enos uh, murders and uh, arson, you know, displacement that took place even at that time. You also have the Methi Hindu Pang uh, and the Pangal, the Methi Muslim conflict of 1993, you have the Paite Kuki conflict of 1997 and 1988, and then various other uh, small kind of uh, tips that have happened. But what uh, somebody said is that, you know, you've always been able to overcome the kind of um, the, 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 the violence, the brutality, the displacement, and the sense of betrayal. And, you know, or by, by the state and the other dominant community. But you've always been able to overcome that and be there. But this time, there is no way back. That is the general sense that, uh, you know, that uh, that one was uh, getting over there. Uh, in terms of what is the plan of the state, I think uh, Brinda Tanajam, the, 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 the resigned uh, is the police officer, what she told us was, the present plan to construct prefabricated houses exposes their sinister design to force the two communities to live in total segregation and isolation. This is the gift of the BJP on the 75th anniversary of India's independence. But of course, I don't think it is as simple as that because if you talk to the, if you look at, you know, what is it that, the, what are the demands that are being made at this point? And I think the cookies have taken a clear stand that separate administration is the only way out. Their demand is a union territory status with an elected uh, legislature. There's a huge uh, hoarding when you enter uh, uh, Chura Chandpur, which says that political solution first, then peace. That is the that is the message that you find all across the uh, all across the hills. And as a, a spokesman of ITLF told us, he said that how is a dialogue possible? It has it has to come from the aggressor who controls the narrative. Also, everyday inflammatory content is put out against the cookies. So why will we think of any dialogue? You cannot perpetuate a view that we are encroachers, infiltrators, poppy cultivators, and then expect a dialogue. 
it has to come from a space of acknowledgement and acceptance on the other hand if you if you in the valley the it's it's again a very very clear unanimous kind of a situate kind of a demand that the that there has to be a withdrawal of the sue agreements that is the suspension of operation agreements with the uh, with the militant uh, with the kuki militant armed groups severe action should be uh, taken against them the territorial integrity of uh, manipur has to be protected and strict action has to be taken against forest encroachments kuki uh, uh, militancy and poppy cultivation and the demand for a separate state should be dropped these are the preconditions even for a uh, for a uh, for a dialogue so you can see that the battle lines are very clearly drawn over here and like i when like i was saying that time the situation has become such that this entire conflict has been manufactured and doctored in such a way that the main the main uh, players the main reasons for this uh, for this violence to have broken out and to have perpetuated which is the union and the state government they are escaping accountability whereas there is this deep kind of a hatred that is now being pushed between uh, uh, between uh, between these uh, two communities so as far as uh, we are concerned uh, the what we what the uh, what this team believes is that any necessary decision and steps ought to be considered within the broad context of restoration of peace in the state and fixing of accountability on the bjp governments both at the center and the state peace is possible on the basis of justice and reconciliation for any political solution to emerge a restoration of peace and normalcy is a must it is the resignation of mr biren singh as chief minister that will mark the first step towards any feasible so political solution to this humanitarian crisis indeed the present bjp government has no legitimacy whatsoever to continue the team appeals to all concerned to cease hostilities and initiate dialogue and peace building measures this could be through the ending of the undeclared blockade to allow safe passage into and out of the valley and secondly by expediting the return of bodies to the cookies to perform a dignified burial for all those dead the team hopes and wishes that these steps would help in securing some respite from the violence towards a peaceful political resolution to the crisis uh, now to the last part which is the recommendations it's i think it's really fair for us to say that very difficult to come up with a set of you know a prescribed set of uh, recommendations given the the kind of the deeply political uh, nature of this conflict and which is continuously you know uh, in that sense you know which has grown over a period of time and like sucheta said that variously various, various uh, fault lines that always existed they have now been uh, you know exaggerated they have been doctored they have been played in a different way having said that they still uh, they, we felt that we we need uh, there are some pressing things that not, that needed to be uh, done urgently and this is something that we also communicated with the uh, with the governor uh, madam anushya okay i request my colleague uh, uh, krishnaveni ji to please take us uh, through the recommendations krishnaveni ji yes 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 uh, actually yes please go ahead krishna viniji okay uh, at, at last day we we were we were in the manipur we met our team will uh, we uh, met has met the with the governor primati anusia uke and made several suggestions including communicating the need for a change at the head of manipur we demand two things from her one the resignation of the uh, chief minister of manipur government um, which is uh, very very necessary to take any uh, restoration uh, any the, uh, the any steps to restore peace in the state and the second one is to make some uh, really some hum immediate humanitarian uh, steps to restore the uh, some conditions restore the conditions of the livelihood of the people staying in the relief camps so uh, so on this basis uh, we had seven recommendations in this article first step we want to uh, insist is the basic communities that is food water 
infrastructure and sanitation health care like education and other services um, of to the people living in the relief camps uh, it is very very odd to see the uh, condition of the people in the relief camps already our people our team people will uh, already explained the situation in the relief camps all you know and the second one is the undeclared blockade when we went to uh, the hill station of churachanpur from the valley of bishnupur we met four at blockades in 1 km we were stopped at four st uh, stages one uh, assam rifles and local police and uh, civil society of mates and also uh, meira pai bees uh, women organization they they were also this uh, the meira pai bees and uh, these people uh, civil society they were collecting money for from each and everybody crossing that line so this is very very uh, 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 well, uh, sabotage to every walk of life to every not only for cookies but also ordinary people to cross that la land and third one is uh, there are 6000 criminal cases were registered in for various offenses but actually the this is not the actual cases but registered cases uh, including murder rape assault and all these things some the state government did not take any step still they against these cases so we have to look after and uh, give recommend uh, we recommend to take actions and arrest the victims and uh, restore the peace to to help the to uh, help restoration of peace in manipur and the fourth rank fourth one is the question of compensation the so many uh, around uh, two, 200 people were uh, dead in this uh, chaos in this uh, so there uh, so many people lost their uh, properties lifetime properties so they have to be compensated to ensure their further life to in the restore their uh, livelihood here after and the fifth one is some relief camps were aided by civil societies especially in the valleys but not in the relief camps in the hills the, there is utter uh, partiality is that uh, government is aiding in the valley side relief camps but they are not at all care about uh, hill side relief camps this uh, the needs of the uh, hills people relief camps people should be addressed and the sixth one is educational institutions uh, in in manipur completely shut down for the past 3 months some private schools were opened in the valleys to the, the some children the, some the valley people children were going to school but not at the hills so restoration of the education schools in the hill side also should be concentrated at the lot last the students of the higher education uh, actually the uh, universities and colleges were completely closed so uh, the students of higher education could not continue their st uh, studies um, so the, we can we can make some steps they were asking us in uh, uh, that is a students association and also personal personally we met uh, some students in the relief camps they asked us to make some arrangement to continue their studies so uh, we can um ask some help from the governments of the southern uh, states other than especially southern states like uh, uh, the state chief minister of 
Kerala government, Comrade Panarai Vijayan, um, asked the people, uh, students of Manipur, to come and study in his state, to continue their studies in his state. Likewise, we should ask other state, chief minister of the southern states to um, give a call to the students of Manipur to continue their studies. So this is the res uh, seven recommendations we have given in this uh, complete article. So we should suggest we have to make some steps to ensure the for the up, uh, implementation of the these recommendations. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Congratulations, uh, Manjeet. So this, uh, I think that this uh, we've kind of more or less covered some some of the main parts of the report. I think we can uh, throw it open now for. Uh, uh, if there's any, uh, you know, questions, any clarifications, also if anybody, you know, wants to share their own experiences, I think uh, uh, it is more than welcome to do so. Send it to me. I think Geeta Menon has raised her hand. Can you just... Uh... Yeah. Um, thanks, uh, team. Very courageous report. And, uh, uh, you know, thanks for giving us uh, this uh, viewpoint and uh, outlook because it's absolutely inhuman. I mean, I'm sure you all have gone through a lot uh, just uh, by covering the entire, uh, entire situation. But it's absolutely inhuman and uh, ter terrible every time one hears about this unnecessary, unnecessary conflict. Uh, I just like to ask two things. One is that, uh, how do you see uh, all this violence and the kind of thing that it has generated? And everyone knows the state ministers, uh, the chief minister's role, the prime minister's role, the state role. I mean, all this is coming out more and more. Uh, how do you think it will impact uh, anything in the 24 elections? Or how do we make it? How do we make it impact? How how do we uh, make it impact or, you know, how do we bring it up so that there is an impact in the 24 elections? The second part, the second thing is that in all this report or in all your visit, uh, what do you think, uh, um, how much role does this whole uh, drug uh, trafficking play? I mean, the drug traffickers, drug trafficking, and because drugs and ammunitions and ammunition Munition supply and drugs, uh, this whole thing is uh, so close together. So in the conflict, which is now being termed as ethnic conflict, or trying to make out it as ethnic conflict, but uh, where is the role and what is the role of the, I mean, where do you see the whole uh, drug mafia and the part that they play in perpetuating this? Thank you, Gita. I, I think we can just take another question. I think Arvind Narayan has raised his hand. We'll take Arvind's and then we can answer that and then move on to the next. Yeah, the, just thanks to the team again to echo Gita for the very uh, important report. And as Gita said, and as all of you have communicated, it's really a very troubling situation. And I think the point which is so different as you'll highlighted from everything else we have faced is we're not talking about a post-conflict situation. So conflict which is still very much underway. And with the complete abdication of responsibility of the state, I'm so glad that you'll made that the central focus of the report. Because really, I mean, what kind of a state allows this kind of a ethnic segregation to happen, as you rightly indicated, in a particular state, and still claims to be a state? And I, I'm just thinking that that gravity of the situation, the fact that, you know, that you have, uh, in a sense, abdicated every constitutional responsibility. 
I mean, if you're under 355, if the if the role of the center is to ensure that constitution is carried out, the sorry, governance is carried out in accordance with the provisions of the constitution, that is obviously completely abdicated. So the the I'm wondering where the gap lies, and you'd imagine that in any other context, something like this would be the burning issue of the day. There's no way the government can be allowed to escape its responsibility. And how is the government pretending that nothing has happened? As you indicated, how is the prime minister not visited once? How is the home minister just visits once? Is it the complete lack of any form of intelligence, any kind of uh, empathy, any kind of a responsibility to deal with the continuing situation? So I think, the, the, I, I think from what you described, again, the cookie point seems to be that it's a continuing situation till you find some solution to this. What's the question of uh, of uh, of peace as it were? So what is that? What is that? And the state needs to come in, in a big way and think. Oh, what is the solution? If the if one one side is saying it's complete uh, segregation, separate separate administration, is it some kind of a uh, uh, three seventy A B C kind of a formulation? What is the formulation which uh, which has come up again? That's not the role of the fact finding report, of course. But that's a political debate which needs to happen. And how is that debate not happening in a, in a significant way? Saying what is the solution? It almost seems like we'll allow this conflict to just keep continuing. How can that be the response of any responsible government? That's the I think that's the core issue which uh, which I felt. And perhaps maybe the question is I mean since you have I mean of course we know that every time. A uh, reporter sort of uh, every time civil society tries to make some kind of an intervention, the Manipur government comes down like a ton of bricks, files an FIR, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, against uh, groups, and I'm sure that has a chilling uh, effect on ability of groups also to take things forward. So in that context, again, as Gita said, very courageous the fact that the reporters come out, but uh, perhaps some thoughts on the ways forward. You know, what can now that you've initiated something. How can everybody come together and say we can take this forward in a in in a way which at least begins to make some kind of a impact difference or at least ensures that the state is forced to listen to this point? How are they ignoring this? Yeah, thank you, thank you, uh, So Cheta, you you want to give it? Uh, you want to start or should I start responding? Uh, anyone else from the team as well? Uh... <laughs> I would just like to probably comment on, uh, well, you know, two of the concerns that are raised by Gita, Gita Minan. Uh, firstly, the fact that, I mean, how do we hold those who are in charge, in who are the so-called custodians of uh, implementing constitutional principles in every territory of India, how do we hold them accountable? Because as has been manifested by our report, that it is a complete breakdown of uh, any kind of constitutional uh, governance in the in the state of Manipur. So you know the principles, the basic the basic uh, uh, fundamental principles of our constitution, they are not operating, and the fact that the state government of Manipur and the central government. And, you know, we must uh, note that these two governments right now, the state government as well as the central government, are being run by the same party. So there is no question of lack of coordination between the state and the center. Because uh, as they call it, as the ruling party themselves call it, it's a double engine government that is that is that is running Manipur right now. And it is under the custodianship of this double engine government that today we see that uh, such a massive level of human disaster has happened. So many people are displaced. There is complete ethnic segregation. Uh, one of the major responsibilities of the custodians of constitution, the government, uh, is to ensure that the unity of the people are maintained, but instead what they have done, obviously there were uh, pre-existing fault lines, but it is under uh, the leadership, the responsibility of the double engine government that uh, 
such a scale of violence has happened where the state has not acted to stop it. Whether the state has failed or not is a different question. But the fact that Manipur is one of the most uh, uh, armed territories, I mean, in the sense that the Indian army exists inside the border. It exists in Manipur. And it exists in the name of maintaining law and order. There are intelligence mechanisms by the Indian government, but of the Indian army. What were they doing? Is not it their responsibility to ensure that human disaster at such a level doesn't happen? Was not it their responsibility to stop it? And if they have failed it, I mean, as far as our observation goes, as far as we have talked to people and as far as our experience from the uh, rest of the country, as far as we understand, uh, you know, something that the present ruling government is master at, which is polarizing, their mode of governance is polarizing, their most of mode of governance is communal conflict. So, yes, I mean, we must hold uh, the present regime accountable. And Manipur is must not be treated as another, you know, just, you know, as, as a northeastern state, which can be easily ignored. Lives lost there can be ignored. People displaced there can be ignored. We are living in a democracy, so we have to ask these questions to the ruling party and to begin with. The fact that under the chief ministership of N. Biran Singh this has happened, he must, uh, he must resign. As far as uh, how can the next steps be taken, I mean, it is really not for us right now to uh, conclude con conclusively or recommend conclusively, but to begin the process of, uh, you know, trusting the government, trusting the constitutional principles in India, uh, you know, somebody has to take responsibility. It is the ruling party which has to take responsibility. Uh, Clifton, if you could answer the rest. Yeah. Uh, I think just, uh, just to clarify one more thing, this is not a conflict that has just happened. It's, you know, our, our understanding is that this is a conflict that has been orchestrated it has been orchestrated as an ethnic divide, which the BJP intends to communally exploit. So, I, you know, it's very clear what their intention is. And of course, as Gita said, and as uh, Sucheta said, this is something that we really need to take on. We need to hold this government you know, responsible for what's happening over there in this ongoing conflict. The question of drug abuse and poppy cultivations, actually, Gita... It's a matter of concern to anyone we spoke to in the valley. There's not anyone over there who feels that, you know, this is something that's really of no, it's not such a big issue and we should not be concerned about it. Genuinely, there is a concern both in the valley and the hills in regard to both poppy cultivation and in regard to the, the drug abuse. And they they would rather that that problem was not there. They would rather that, you know, uh, that this was dealt with. And actually, the cookies have this to say, you know, that uh, firstly, that you know there's, there's an overestimation you know there's a there's a there's a there's an entire otherizing there's a you know, uh, you're criminalizing an entire community in the name of uh, poppy cultivation that is something that they just don't like what they've repeatedly said is that see there is a uh, there is a legacy issue over here the hills have been traditionally neglected the farming in the hills has been traditionally neglected it is nothing compared to the kind of agriculture that you have in the valley they are repeatedly seeking for support over there. Village chieftains have repeatedly approached the government saying that support the agriculture because poor farmers are getting sucked into poppy cultivation. Poppy cultivation is, is expensive business. It's not something that can be done by a poor, you know, uh, poppy farmer somewhere in the forest unless there's like a huge, you know, kind of a uh, backup to it. So these are just the cultivators, uh, uh, you know, they're literally like the laborers of somebody else's business. So the uh, people over there, the chieftains, the organizations have repeatedly said, you please, you please protect, you you help the workers, you help the, uh, the farmers so that they don't get into this. That is something not they, that they've not done. Instead, what they've done is that they're going at the poor farmer or the village chieftain. And now that is creating a very, very serious problem, uh, a lot of anger in the cookie community. And if you ask me, I think that is absolutely valid. If there, if studies have shown that the best way to treat uh, to deal with poppy cultivation is not by going and you know uh, attacking a poor farmer. It is by addressing it in this way. You ensure that their livelihoods are protected, are provided in a, in a more meaningful way in other ways, and then that can be taken care of. 
and there there's an utter failure of the state government and of course like i said brinda tajinam she has actually gone on record there are affidavits that she has filed on court where she explicitly blames the chief minister's office for having a hand in the uh, in the in this in this entire drug issue especially in the release of this one particular person anyone you speak to in the valley will tell you see everyone is involved in the drug business in fact mlas are also involved in this but then the cookie cultivator the poor farmer is the villain that's how it's playing itself out the question that arvind was saying actually manipur comes under 371c so you already have that kind of a special mechanism for at the direct administration over there there's a hills committee also that has been constituted which is basically the mlas of the of you know elected from there but this has just been rendered um, more or less ineffectual uh, by by the government uh, you know uh, which is in part and uh, which is why now the demand is for way beyond that and uh, i i know the question of you know what from here it's a very very difficult question for us also even in writing the report we've been we tried to be you know as objective and honest uh, to what we have heard over there you know in the sense that not to get you know uh, carried away but if you listen to the arguments from either side it's extremely persuasive and as far as the cookies are concerned they are saying that see we have faced this now for too many years for us to continue with this any more so it you are really at a point where there are these demands which are at totally at loggerheads and then you know the question of what happens from here is i think it's a it's it's really a question very difficult to answer which is why in our report we have just said you know that let this chief minister step down at least to that extent you will have some amount of space a political space created for a uh, for probably a dialogue to actually initiate and for some steps of confidence uh, measure buildings from uh, from both communities uh, i'll end here i think uh, 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 angela and uh, mithu have raised their hand i please i request you to to share your views angela uh, hi everybody hi, hi. And, uh, thank you so much for the visit uh, as well as the uh, very comprehensive uh, report mm, i think it must have been difficult uh, because even for us when we had visited uh, after returning it was just so difficult <laughs> to process what we heard and what we saw and uh, i think we brought also with us a sense of helplessness you know as citizens uh, that we are unable to um, ensure that the governments do what governments should be doing in a situation like this uh, but um, the other thing uh, because the first time we went we got caught up in a lot of um things that were happening on the ground a lot of violence uh, so we uh, undertook a second visit and i think this is what i would like to share with the group is that the longer we allow this to continue obviously things are changing on the ground every day but narratives are getting cemented as well as um controlled by certain interests so when we visited again just after two weeks this feeling you know the first visit it was unanimous about biren singh having failed having failed and needing to step down and needing to be held accountable by the second visit when we were in the valley we met again a cross section a lot of women a lot of mera pavis also and they were saying a new angle was brought in the eviction the forest eviction uh, and interestingly they were circulating documents which showed that much of the people evicted were not even cookies they were maithes and it was such a beautifully crafted document powerpoints and uh, and so they were using that to say that actually biren singh has done nothing wrong he has gone by the book notices of eviction were given and 
it was only after that that they evicted. And anyway, majority that were evicted were Mehtes. So that is a new now focus, which is being pushed by certain interests to justify certain things that are happening. And like for us in the region also, it's very frightening because uh, we really think that it is some sort of experimentation that is happening to see how much you can divide the people here. Because um, it is a region that has experienced conflict. We have had militancy. We live with militancy. It is the most highly militarized and all of that. But this time, it is different. It is different in the sense that, like, even in the years of militancy in Manipur, the state would try, to, I mean, horrific things that the state also did in terms of, you know, encounters and all that. But they were trying, I mean, they were showing their presence in whichever form. Here, it appears as though they are working for somebody or something else altogether. And I think we, we cannot uh, undermine that. And I don't know if you also, mm, people also spoke to you about the geopolitics of this conflict, no? And I think that those elements and those factors are also very true about who's supporting the junta and who is on the civil liberties side of the conflict in, in Myanmar and what effect that is ha having. It may not be the primary reason or whatever, but it is being used. It is um, uh, providing a very uh, sort of good space within which this orchestrated conflict is playing out. So I think um, for us who are not in Manipur, who are able to do things is that we have to understand, you know, like one of our team members when we were traveling together, she was saying, it's so difficult when I'm sitting with the cookies and talking to them. I tend towards them. When I'm talk talking to the Mehtes, you know, I feel that they have a point. But the thing is, both sides, not just one side, both sides, there are people who have been radicalized to the cause, whatever cause. And we have to try to understand that the silencing at that level of sane voices of has not only started now in Manipur. And so even among the Meite, there is an entire community of people who are who at a personal level will talk about how we want them to return to the valley. We have always lived with the cookies. It's not going to be the same. Like for all of us, the only state we know is Manipur. But uh, those voices are not being allowed. They don't feel comfortable, safe enough to raise those voices. And so for us, I think we have to create a space somehow for those voices from both sides, you know, uh, to say these things. And uh, other than that, the immediate need I, I I remember one person saying, it's okay if you go back and try and raise funds and all that. But also at one level, if funds start coming and if we're if the government keeps seeing us running these camps, they will they will give up even trying to fulfill their duties. So we don't even know whether we should ask you or not ask you for help, even in the with regard to the relief camps, you know. And they must have told you about, like, for instance, in Churachanpur, if they wished, or in Kangpokpi, um, schools and educational institutions could have run. But the fact that they have not reopened is that they, don't, they, they said they don't want to project an image as if things are under control and things are normal now. 
the minute schools and institutions open, then Bairin Singh will claim, see, nothing's wrong. Everything's happening. And, you know, and that is the primary reason why they're not uh, having the schools going in these places. So those are the sort of small nitty gritties that are there on the ground. So that much for now, I think. Well, thank you, Angela. Actually, I think you speak as insightfully as uh, as you write. And uh, some of the points that you've made are definitely things that uh, we have encountered as well, particularly uh, the question of the opening of the schools. Uh, I think also, you know, uh, to be really honest with you, uh, for us, I think um, the this is this is such a complicated kind of situation that, and like most conflicts are obviously, uh, but like you rightly said, that one is the radicalization, but the polarization in this particular conflict is is almost complete in that sense. You know, uh, for me, one of the things that really was uh, was uh, troubling was uh, the inability to acknowledge that the other side also has faced hurt. It's almost like a grudging uh, kind of acknowledgement which may come, if at all. Otherwise, it's always about demonization. It's always about justifications. It's always about, you know, a what about it? It's just that. But to say that, you know, and, and this again, you know, the, uh, there are people both in the valley and in the hills who we met who would tell us, you know, see, we understand that there's hurt on both sides, you know, and we know that there's pain on both sides. And they'll be honest and say, yeah, but but without a doubt, obviously, the cookies have faced much more. But that does not mean that the Mehtes have not uh, suffered. So I think there are some of these, you know, things that you pick up in from the conversations over there that are extremely, uh, you know, I think it points to the to the to the deep deep problem uh, that actually is over there, and I agree with you. This point that you made about uh, you know that some kind of experiment taking place. This at least some four or five people told us, saying that there is no doubt. This is some this the idea is to keep the pot boiling boiling because there is some other uh, design over here. So thank you, Angela. There are two more people who have raised their hands. Oh. Are there? Jojo and. Mithi, Jojo and uh, and Mithu had raised their hands. Mithu. Mithu. Hi everyone. Uh, main to nahi baat kar paungi angrezi mein. Main Hindi mein hi baat kar paungi. To actually uh, Manipur ke baare mein jo bhi aap logo ne zan kari di, usme kafi saari chije nahi thi pehle. Aise हम लोग जब एपुआ का मीटिंग कर रहे थे उस समय प्रतिमा जी ने हम लोग को बहुत क्लियर किया था मणिपुर के बारे में एक्चुअली uh, मैं झारखंड से हूं तो मैं साफ देख पा रही हूं कि कैसे मणिपुर में एक सरकार के द्वारा uh, कैसे दो समुदायों को लड़ाया जा सकता है वो उसमें सफल भी हुए कई हद तक लेकिन इसका जो एक्चुअल मुद्दा है जमीन वाला और वहां के मिनरल्स निकालने जंगलों पे कब्जा कैसे करें क्योंकि वहां छठवीं अनुसूची लागू है तो वहां पूरा अधिकार आदिवासियों के पास है ग्राम सभा के पास है तो वो जमीन नहीं ले सकते हैं उनके अधिकारों के बिना और इन सारी चीजों को खारिज करने के लिए एक दूसरी जनजाति को उससे लड़ाना की आप वो सारा अधिकार उनको भी मिल जाए तो वो जमीन बड़ी आसानी से ले लेंगे मेरे ख्याल से ये मेन चीज था जिसके जरिए वहां की जमीन लूट हो सके और वहां के मिनरल्स पे जो कॉर्पोरेट है उनका कब्जा किया जा सके पिछले सालों से झारखंड में भी जो जंगल्स हैं सारे जो आदिवासियों के कब्जे में है उन सब पर कॉर्पोरेट की और स्टेट गवर्नमेंट और सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट की नजर है खासकर दुमका जैसे क्षेत्रों में तो यहाँ भी पिछले साल से आप लोग देख रहे होंगे कि कुर्मी और महातो जो दो जातियां हैं जनजातियां हैं ये भी आदिवासी होने के लिए अपना एक मांग रख रही हैं और संघर्ष कर रही है कि हमें भी आदिवासियों में जगह दी जाए और सबसे आश्चर्य की बात है कि ये लोग कई घटनाएं ऐसे भी झारखंड में हुई है कि ये लोग आदिवासियों को नीचा देखते हैं लेकिन ये खुद आदिवासी होने का मांग कर रहे हैं ये रघुबर दास के जाने के बाद मतलब अभी हेमंत सरकार सोरेन की सरकार है झारखंड में जेएमएम की इसके पहले भाजपा की ही सरकार थी तो जब भाजपा की सरकार थी तभी से ये प्लानिंग चल रही थी कि कैसे जो कुर्मी और महातो है ये एक्चुअल किसान है इनके पास मैदानी क्षेत्र यहाँ भी ज्यादा है 
पहाड़ों में जैसे रहते आदिवासी तो झारखंड में भी जो एक्चुअल जमीन के मालिक है जहाँ खेती होती है वो कुर्मी और महातो के ही पास है सेम सिचुएशन क्रिएट करने की एक कोशिश है और इस कोशिश में आप देखिएगा कि पिछले बार भी रेल रोको आंदोलन वगैरह हुआ था पुलिया जैसे क्षेत्रों में सिल्ली मुरी में अभी ठीक दो दिन पहले भी एक ऐसा आंदोलन हुआ जिसको भले ही पुलिस ने रोक दिया लाठीचार्ज करके लेकिन अभी आ, दो या तीन दिन पहले चौसठ संगठनों की एक लिस्ट जारी हुई है झारखंड में जिसको बोला गया है कि ये सारे माओवादी संगठनों से संपर्क रखते हैं और इन चौसठ संगठनों में मैक्सिमम संगठन वो संगठन है जो आदिवासियों का संगठन है और उसमें हमारा आदिवासी संघर्ष मोर्चा भी एक नाम आर वाई भी एक नाम और इसके अलावा भी जो नाम है वो सारे लगभग लगभग वो राइट ऑफ फूड आदिवासी जन अधिकार मैंने जो भी आदिवासियों के लिए जो लड़ाई लड़ रहे हैं ये सारे मैक्सिमम उन्हीं संगठनों का नाम है और ये जो पूरे झारखंड में भी जो जमीन जंगल की लूट होने वाली है जंगल जंग इसके लिए एक प्रेशर मतलब एक तरह का ये क्रिएट शायद हो सकता है जैसा मणिपुर में हुआ तो ये एक बड़ा चिंतनीय विषय मुझे लगता है कि जिस तरह से मणिपुर में एक कृत्रिम रूप से एक मैंने डिजास्टर का क्रिएट किया गया बनाया गया कि जिसमें महिलाओं के साथ अत्याचार हुआ लोग एक दूसरे पे यकीन नहीं कर पा रहे मार रहे सेम एक ऐसी स्थिति झारखंड में एक प्री प्लान बनाने की तैयारी की जा रही है इस तरह की एक स्थिति है इससे हमने एक हम लोग भी जो काम कर रहे हैं क्या हम लोग को उसमें करना चाहिए किस तरह से हम लोग को मैंने हम लोग आदिवासियों के बीच में काम कर रहे हैं लेकिन रियलिटी है कि हम लोग के पास अभी भी आदिवासी कैडर वगैरह बहुत कम है तो हम लोग उसको कैसे कर सकते हैं ठीक है धन्यवाद मिट्टू जी ये जो बात आपने कहा कि दो चीजें मुझे लगता है बहुत ही जरूरी है एक चीज ये है कि जो पूरा जो मिनरल रिसोर्सेस की बात है और ये बार बार मणिपुर में बात किया गया और रिपोर्ट में उसका हम लोगों ने उल्लेख भी किया है कि वहां पर जो यूरेनियम है प्लेटिनियम प्लेटिनियम है ऑयल है और उसको लेकर जो बहुत सारे मल्टी नेशनल अलग अलग जो एक इंटरेस्टेड वेस्टेड इंटरेस्ट है उसको चीन लेने का पूरा जो एक कोशिश मणिपुर में भी किया जा रहा है और उससे और ये जो है इस कॉन्फ्लिक्ट से उनका संबंध के बारे में भी इस रिपोर्ट में हम लोग दर्ज की और दूसरा ये जो एसटी स्टेटस वाला जो आपने कहा ये बिल्कुल झारखंड में भी देखने को मिल रहा है और वही एक तरीका आपको कश्मीर में भी मिलने को मिलता है जहाँ पर वहां पर शायद चार चार और अभी समुदाय को एस स्टेटस देने की पूरा एक बात चल रही है इंक्लूडिंग गड्ढा ब्राह्मण जो है मतलब जो अपर कास्ट वाले हैं उनको एस स्टेटस मिलाने की ताकि ये पूरा जो एस स्टेटस का एक एक पहचान है आदिवासियों का पूरा जो एक पहचान है उसी को नाश करने का एक षयंत्र है और ऑब्वियसली इस चीज को हर राज्य में हम लोगों को विरोध करना चाहिए थैंक यू मिट्टू जी आई थिंक अनेक अकीला हैंड इंग्लिश में भी बेटर okay because uh, the previous one said he, she can't follow english anyway um, from the very beginning it's been very clear that uh, the state government and the central government is very partial and also uh, i had seen one video where uh, uh, biren singh was uh, uh, telling stating that uh, if they if the cookies don't stop cultivating the poppies he is going to declare war against them these are the words that uh, he has used so it has been taken place the war has been declared and uh, uh, these people have suffered a lot now i just because you people have visited the place i wanted to know i just want to know um that what is the percentage of cookies are living in their relief camps and uh, also the metheis uh, because as you people mentioned one of you have mentioned that uh, uh, in the valley the life is somehow coming to uh, 
little uh, to a little extent coming to the normal see there are some schools uh, started and these people have uh, 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 you know have started encroaching the properties of cookies in the valley and all those kind of things but uh, is it really happening uh, uh, the encroachment of uh, methes land in the hills by cookies so if so what is the percentage uh, that they are living in the relief camps and they are they living in the uh, their original places and finally i just want to know in view of the recent judgment of supreme court about the taking back uh, the forest land and also can you know conserve it uh, so what would be the state for cookies if at all if the government start uh, taking back the forest land uh, from all the people who have occupied it uh, for whatever the purposes so what will happen to the cookies that's all and mm -hmm. and i really appreciate every one of you each one of you uh, that you had been there and uh, uh, seen and uh, taken the statements given some kind of consolence if if you know consoling them to an extent uh, and all those kind of things i really salute your uh, effort in this regard thank you thank you akila i'll just give the statistics and then uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, madhulika uh, or uh, Pratima ji also can just uh, reply to the second part. So basically, in terms of numbers, uh, there are around 12,000 uh, uh, conflict displaced uh, cookies in the camps in uh, Kankoki district. There are around 40,000 conflict displaced cookies in the uh, relief camps in, uh, in Churachandpur. And in the valley, it is around 16,000 people in uh, the conflict displaced methes in the uh, in the uh, in the uh, camps, we tried to get the complete uh, data on that, but it's uh, extremely difficult uh, to get. So these are the at least the information that we collected. Though we have the full details of the uh, of the uh, uh, of the displaced cookies uh, for all the camps in uh, Kankuki. Uh, Madhulika, you want to take the second part, Madhu? Hi, hi. I'm so sorry. I just missed the second part of the question. If you could just uh, briefly summarize, Lupta. Uh, hello. Uh, 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 Akila. See, uh, I, I'll just start answering it and then maybe uh, Madhulika can pick up. The question of, uh, of the properties that, are, that you know, people have lost and what's going to happen to it is a question that is there across Manipur. It is not just in the valley. It is not just in the hills. The numbers, are, of course, you know, uh, are skewed uh, in that sense. You know, obviously, more uh, cookies have been displaced. So, obviously, more of their uh, properties are, uh, are, uh, you know, are in question at this point in time. So there have been various reports now. You know, one of the things that we heard uh, when we were in Kankokpi is that around 230 uh, cookies have actually approached a lawyer over the period of you know, this entire time and given details of their property saying that this property was rented to such and such person, that person is not paying me my rent. Or this is a property that, you know, I was going to buy. I paid 60% of the money. The 40% I, I, I uh, you know, I obviously cannot pay now because I've lost money. And when I ask for the 60% back, that person is not giving. So you have a various shades of all of these problems. On the Mehta side, when we were speaking to them, for them, of course, you know, the that their properties have been burnt. Their properties have been demolished. Uh, there were some reports of, you know, bulldozers being run, uh, clearing out any trace of, uh, of a Mehta property to have been existed over there. And this, in fact, is a question that we squarely put to the uh, superintendent of police in Kankokpi. That how are you going to ensure that the properties of the methes who have gone out from here and the cookies who have come from there, how are you going to ensure that their lands are, uh, their properties are protected beyond the, the damage that's already done to it, obviously. So it's not encroached, you know, that's what we meant. And they said that they're going to put some systems in place, but clearly that's not been done. And even if it has, there's really no communication about that. 
but in terms of the figures that is very very difficult you know for us to say how many properties may have been encroached or not because that's a, i don't even think that that kind of information is available at this time uh, madhulika you want to just add to that yes, please i have nothing uh, specific to add other than you know for this for this sort of detail to be connected we have collected we need the state to be involved um uh, it's it's and also like like we said that in um, in couple of these districts the fact is that land is also held together so it's very difficult to understand i mean the the situation there is completely different and uh, i don't i don't think anyone's put out that kind kind of stats yet and even if such stats have to be collected i do think that the government needs to be involved but i think um, clifton has more or less covered everything thanks madhu uh, jojo you want to go now yeah hello hi hi jojo yeah yeah hi uh, am i audible yes yes very loud and clear please please okay. go ahead um yeah first of all i would like, like to thank each and everyone uh that for giving an opportunity to share my experiences and uh, i just wanted to add some point what angela made earlier now uh, she made out a point about radicalized uh, community of in both sides so like people from both sides who have been radicalized so and how it would be um, how we should go forward to bring peace between the community so upon that uh, i would like to add some point from my experiences is that uh, i myself i belong to a kuki i belong to a kuki community and i have been born and brought up in imphal in the valley itself and i have a lot of meeting friends so and i still talk with them till today and i still discuss with them about the ongoing situations we talk about what has been going wrong and what has where uh, the, the government has failed us and how the radicalized section of the like what the communities have failed us and instigated all this so there are like many reasonable and rational people in both the sections of the society but as angela angela said uh, she pointed out these voices are being suppressed and they need to come out further so i would like to add on that um, my point is that even if those voices are given a chance you know to to raise their voices and even if peace is come like even if peace is restored i don't think there will be uh, it's a, it's going to be an impossible task uh, for both the community to be living in a same geographical area together again and this is one thing i would like to make it clear and make people understand that uh because even i myself have fled imphal so going back to imphal again even if if uh, peace is restored it's, it has put a scar on myself it has put a mark on my mind and then i will always feel the threat that i'm going to be attacked and there won't be uh it will be a lot, it will be a sleepless night and there won't be any peace in our minds it goes to both the mates and the cookies as well the mates will they won't go back i mean even if you tell them the peace is restored they will never go back to they will never return to the hills where they have settled once and even the same goes for the cookies so this is one thing which we should understand and why the cookies or community have demanded for separate administration it's only because that there's a distress complete distress among the communities and it cannot be it cannot ever be restored based on the horrific incidents people have faced and it's not only because of the radicalized sections of the society it's also because of the government who didn't take timely actions and both the and when i say government i i mean the center and the state government if the incident had been uh, nipped at the bud on the may 3rd on the eve of the may 3rd or by 4th if people if people were heard like they were demanding for president rule in the beginning of the night itself and till now there is no president rule and even if it's imposed now it has it is too late so there is a like someone said earlier i don't know who pointed out the narratives has been are being cemented and then people are being you know it it has gone to a communal uh, angle at first it was not a communal angle it was a political angle about the st demand poppy cultivation everything this and that it, it has a long way back history but then now it has gone to a communal angle and so i don't think peace is something we which cannot be restored easily even if it does people can forgive and forget but not they don't have the trust to live you know with each other anymore 
So I think that's what I want to make a point. That's it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jojo, and really uh, our deepest uh, sympathies for you know what you have gone through personally. I mean, I cannot tell you for us, you know, just listening to what you said and uh, just brings back, you know, memories of all those horrendous stories that we heard from everyone else over there. Each person, I think, you know, is going to carry that scar for a very long time. I think the point that uh, you really made is something uh, which is what we have also sensed that perhaps uh, one, one will probably move to a point where you can forgive and forget. But living together is just, uh, uh, that doesn't seem like a, uh, an option at this point. But thank you. Uh, thank you, Jojo, for sharing that. Your yeah, thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to share their or ask any question? There was one question from Lavanya Ravja in terms of how she could be able to help. Uh, I'd request one of our uh, uh, team members to just reply to her. Uh, just give her our email address. Uh, Lavanya, you can just get in touch with us. We can definitely put you in touch with, uh, you know, organizations both in the valley and in the hills who are helping out with relief activities and uh, you can, uh, you know, you can obviously do the need from there. So is there anyone else who would like to ask something or... Any closing uh, remarks from any of the team members? Sucheta? Uh, no, actually, actually, Akila was raising her hands, Chetan. Who, Akila? Uh, Akila was again raising her hands, I saw. Okay, Akila, can you please go ahead? Yeah, um, it is uh, from one, you know, from the deepest of my heart, uh, I would like to say sorry and condolences to the all the people uh, for this loss, and especially for Jojo. Um, please don't mind me asking Jojo uh, if the Akila, you're not audible. Um, how about now? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, you didn't hear anything which I said till now? Uh, Akila, no, no. Please go ahead because there are other people also raise their hand. So if you can just ask your question, then we, we, we can, I think we can answer that. Yeah, uh, this is a question for Jojo and also if anybody from Manipur. Uh, okay. is, is it really, uh, do you, I mean, since you have lost faith in the government, the present government, how do you think that the president rule will help you? Uh, and also when you are not uh, ready to come together, though you are friends with uh, Metis and Metis have friends with the uh, uh, cookie people, uh, what are the other solutions that you are uh, looking forward? Like, is it the division of the state into half, both the valley and the hills? Or uh, uh, is it, what is the solution that uh, you people are thinking? Um, please don't mind me asking this. Please no, go I, ahead. Thank I think, you. Akila, I, I, think it, uh, it, I think we'll let uh, Jojo be. Uh, I think in terms of what the demands of the of the cookie community is, that's very, very clear. They want a separate administration. They want a union territory status with an elected legislature. They are, as far as they are concerned, that is a non-negotiable uh, demand. And which is what even uh, uh, Jojo is trying to say, you know, that uh, even if uh, we can think of peace, even if we can think of forgiveness, there is no question of living together here or after. Uh, Angela, you, you had your hands up. Uh, could you please uh, go ahead? Hello. Yes, Angela. Yes, yes. Um, no, I just want to again respond to what Jojo was saying. And I'm saying this like, uh, you know, with a very, very heavy heart. Uh, 
when I said that what they're doing in Manipur this time around is different, it's an experimentation. And then earlier, our sister from the Carby Hills was talking about how they're trying to divide, for instance, making Meghalaya and Assam fight. There are tensions now on the border. There was attempts to make the Garo and the Khasi communities war over again reservation and quotas within Meghalaya just a few months ago. We cannot afford to be used by these you know, uh, powers like this and to accept their narrative that we do not want or cannot live together anymore because uh, that can never be a reality in the region also for all of us. And uh, I know right now for people who are not from Manipur, who have not suffered the immediate impact of this conflict, we almost don't have a right to say this. But we have to remember that, for instance, the Naga Kuki conflict happened. It was already also so bloody. It was so difficult. And yet, the Kukis and the Nagas inhabit the hills side by side, again and still in Manipur. And if we um, allow for this narrative that we cannot live together, first of all, also practically it is impossible. You know, the, the other thing when we were talking to people in Churachanpur, including the leaders of the Kuki NP, the ITLF, there was a bit of apprehension about, you know, whether really a separation of that kind. When they were saying separate administration, they hadn't fleshed it out, they hadn't said it. Earlier they were saying, actually, we wanted six schedule, but now we've been pushed so much that we want separate administration. You know, if you cut it down and sort of look at what it means for this separate administration, it is actually a lot of it is this disparity, which you know, they feel, which means that, for instance, the disparity in funding and access to central schemes in development. And that is something doable. It is something doable within our constitution. And we, the people on the ground, have to push for those things. You know, but we cannot give in to this idea that, you know, I'm not saying now. Now it's too painful to talk about returning or going back but the longer we postpone it also talking about that possibility because people finally want to go back to their homes many people said we don't have any other homes than here you know so we have to keep that as the larger vision the larger hope how we get there we'll figure out we'll maybe lose our way a little here and there but uh, the final solution or the final say cannot be that, no, we cannot live together anymore. Because it's not just for you in Manipur now. It is for all of us in the region. We have to continue to live like this in our messy way. And we'll continue to have fights also here and there and everywhere. But no problem. We will sort it out, you know. Yeah, thank you, Angela. I think uh, that's a very difficult conversation to have, uh, uh, generally speaking, and most definitely it's more it's very difficult to have over uh, uh, over a Zoom meeting. But I think uh, you know something uh, at least as far as uh, this team is concerned and our own learning is concerned, uh, the political choices that communities are making there are obviously you know uh, very difficult ones. Uh, very difficult ones for them to arrive at and very difficult ones for them to even sustain. So I think in, in that context, you know, it remains to be seen uh, what really happens. Uh, as far as we are concerned, you know, we, we've made it very clear what we feel are, you know, certain steps that are absolutely essential uh, towards, towards resolving this. And there can be no doubt that, you know, uh, without justice, reconciliation becomes really uh, almost... Uh, uh, it's just something that you can just talk about as if it doesn't become a reality in, in that sense. 
but of course you know one is speaking as uh, not as someone who lives in the in any of the states of the northeast so i think uh, you know I, i'll bow to your wisdom on that so i think we yeah we've been here now for almost 3 hours and uh, there's still a fair number of you left so that's a good thing uh, i think if there's no more questions we'll kind of uh, wrap up here and on behalf of the team uh, you know i'd really like to thank each and every one of you for being here i particularly would like to thank uh, angela we reached out to her and told her that we are having this report release and she very kindly agreed to to participate in this uh, your insights have been totally uh, very very uh, useful uh, uh, for us as well thank you angela for being part of this i also like to thank uh, another friend who's from shillong tarun batia who's also uh, been here this entire time to do this entire release and of course uh, jojo and a couple of other friends from uh, manipur who were here uh, in this meeting uh, i you know our report is now public it's uh, available online uh, i think avni has shared the uh, shared the uh, the link uh, to the report i request everyone to please download a copy i, I will look at it i'm sure that you know there will be mistakes in that i'm sure that there will be uh, uh, several shortcomings in that Uh, but i think we've been uh, to we've been objective and true to the testimonies uh, to that we've heard from the people and to the grief and you know the kind of anguish uh, that they are going through so yes thank you everyone and uh, good night bye